Hello and welcome to our penultimate lesson. This week we'll start talking about integration. We're going to cover chapters 30, 31 and 32, talking about antiderivatives. What is integration and the definite integral? And then next week's lesson we will finish talking about calculus. We'll finish talking about some techniques to use to calculate integrals. First, antiderivatives. What is an antiderivative? A function capital F is an antiderivative small f on some interval i if the rule that the derivative of capital F is equal to small f is true for all x in the interval. For example, We know that 2x is the derivative of x squared. Change this around. We have that x squared is an antiderivative of 2x. This is like saying that 2x is the derivative of x squared, but doing it backwards. It's the opposite of doing a derivative, we're doing backwards. For example, if small g of x is equal to cos x, then an antiderivative of small x is sine x. Because the derivative of big G, the derivative of sine, is equal to cos, which is equal to small g of x. Cos is the derivative of sine. Sine is an antiderivative of cos. And we can combine these two examples together x squared plus sine x is an antiderivative of 2x plus cos x. Because if we differentiate x squared plus sine x, we get 2x plus cos x. Previously I said that x squared is an antiderivative of 2x, but it's not the only antiderivative. I didn't say the antiderivative, I said an antiderivative. For example, 2x plus 1 is also an antiderivative of 2x. We know that if we differentiate x squared plus 1, we get 2x. And x squared plus 5 is an antiderivative of 2x. And x squared minus 1, 2, 3, 4 is an antiderivative of 2x. How can we write down all of these antiderivatives in one way. We can write them as f of x plus some constant c, where capital F of x is an antiderivative of small f. This is called the general antiderivative of small f. For example, find an antiderivative of 3x squared, which satisfies the rule that capital F of 1 is equal to minus 1. How do we do this? First, we're going to find an antiderivative, any antiderivative. And I'm going to start with the antiderivative x cubed. This is an antiderivative of 3x squared because the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. As soon as we know one antiderivative, we can write down the general antiderivative by doing a plus c on the end x cubed plus c is the general antiderivative of 3x squared. We've done the first part. We found the general antiderivative of 3x squared. But we're not finished the question yet because we're also asked to satisfy the condition that f of 1 is equal to minus 1. So we'll put that just here. I want f of 1 to be equal to minus 1. And I know that f of 1 is 1 cubed plus c, or 1 plus c. So I need to have minus 1 is equal to 1 plus c. And this implies that I must have that the constant c is minus 2. And then I have my answer. We know that the antiderivative must be x cubed plus c for some constant, and now we know that the constant must be minus 2. So the answer to this question is x cubed minus 2. 
we run through the derivatives of some simple functions. And then I'll go through the, the antiderivatives of some easy functions. First of all, we know that the derivative of x to the power m is n x to the power n minus 1. We know that the derivative of sine kx is k cos kx. We know that the derivative of cos kx minus k sine kx is minus k sine kx. And an example we haven't done in this course, but you may already know, the derivative of e to the power of kx is k e to the power of x. Now let's look at some antiderivatives. I'm going to look at antiderivatives of x to the power of m, with the extra condition here that n is not equal to minus 1. You'll see why. Sine kx, cos kx, e to the power of kx again. First, when we differentiate x to the power of n, we're decreasing the power by 1, and we're multiplying by n. How can we do the opposite of that? The opposite of decreasing the power is increasing the power, and the opposite of multiplying by a number is dividing by a number. General antiderivative of x to the power n is x to the power n plus 1 divided by x plus 1, and then always plus a constant if we're doing general antiderivative. We can check that this is correct by differentiating this. We do the derivative of this. What do we get? x to the power n plus 1. We decrease the power to x to the power n. We multiply by the previous power, n plus 1. We're still dividing by n plus 1, and the derivative of the constant is 0. So really, we just end up with x to the power n, which is what we wanted. Next, I want to find the general antiderivative of sine. And I'm not looking at the derivative of sine, I'm looking at the derivative of cos. The derivative of cos kx is minus k sine kx. Let's go backwards, go from right to left. The antiderivative of sine kx must be minus 1 over k cos kx. Compare these two lines above, these two lines which, which I've underlined. When we differentiate cos, we get multiplied by minus k. So when we go the opposite, we should be divided by 1 over k and minus. We differentiate cos, it turns into sine. We go the opposite way. Antiderivative of sine turns into cos. And always, don't forget this, plus constant on the end. We can do the same thing for the antiderivative cos kx. Derivative of sine is cos, so an antiderivative of cos is sine. When we differentiate sine kx, it's multiplied by k. So if we do the opposite, it's divided by k, or multiplied by 1 over k. And likewise, an antiderivative of e to the power of kx is 1 over k e to the power of kx plus c. We have the sum rule and the constant rule, multiple rule for antiderivatives, just as we have it for derivatives. Suppose that capital F is an antiderivative of small f. Suppose that capital G is an antiderivative of small g. And suppose that k is a number. How can we find the general antiderivative of f plus g? It's going to be capital F plus capital G, and then always plus a constant. Likewise, how can we find the, the general antiderivative of the number k multiplied by small f? It's just going to be the number k multiplied by capital F, and then always plus C. Now I'm going to take a break.
For the next example, I want to find general antiderivative of three over root x plus sine two x. Now note here, we can break our function up into easier functions. Our function f looks like three g plus h, where g of x is equal to one divided by the square root of x, and h of x is sine two x. We know an antiderivative of g using the formula from before. Antiderivative of x to the power minus a half. We increase the power by one, so it's minus a half plus one, and then we divide by this new number, divided by minus a half plus one. That's x to the power of a half divided by a half, or two root x. An antiderivative of h we can also find using the formula from the previous slide. An antiderivative of small h is minus a half cos 2x. Put this together, we have 3 capital G plus capital H, that's 6 square root of x minus a half cos 2x, and then as always, plus c on the end. We have another name for the general antiderivative of f. The general antiderivative of f is also called the indefinite integral of f. And we have a special way to write this. We write integral sign, this large capital S, f of x dx. This large s at the start is called the integral sign. The function that we're integrating is called the integrand. And the dx on the end tells us that x is the variable of integration. For example, some of the functions we've looked at already, some of the antiderivatives that we've looked at already, in this new notation. The indefinite integral of 2x, or the general antiderivative of 2x, is x squared plus c. The indefinite integral of cos x, there's a typo here, because there should be a dx just here, is sine x plus c. And the indefinite integral of 2x plus cos x is x squared plus sine x plus c. We always only need one constant on the end. If we added x squared plus c together with sine x plus c, we don't need to have two different constants to combine them together. We we'll just have one constant on the end. For example, calculate the indefinite integral of x squared minus 2x plus 5. I'm going to solve this in two different ways. Let's suppose we know an antiderivative of this integrand already. Let's suppose we already know that the derivative of x cubed over 3 minus x squared plus 5x is this integrand. Then all we need to do is we need to take this function and do plus c. Or let's suppose we don't already know an, an antiderivative. We might want to split our indefinite integral up into three easier indefinite integrals. Instead of doing the indefinite integral of x squared minus 2x plus 5, we could break this up into the indefinite integral of x squared minus the indefinite integral of 2x plus the indefinite integral of 5. And then we could look at each of these separately. The first one, we would have x cubed over 3 plus some constant, which I'm writing as c1, minus x squared plus some constant, which I'm calling c2, plus 5x plus some constant, which I'm calling c3. Rearrange these and we put all the constants at the end. But remember, I said we only need one constant. We don't need to have three different constants. C1 is just some number we don't know, C2 is just some number we don't know, and C3 is just some number that we don't know. This C1 minus C2 plus C3 altogether is just some number that we don't know. We can give this a new name. We can call this number C. 
And then we can write the answer to this problem as x cubed over 3 minus x squared plus 5x. And then for the numbers which we don't know, for all of the numbers we don't know combined, we can just write plus c. Let's do an example from physics. Let's suppose you drop a box off the top of a tall building. We're going to assume that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. And we're going to assume that we can ignore air resistance or drag. The question is, how far does the box fall in five seconds? Here's a picture. At the top is my bad drawing of what I think you look like. You're standing on the top of this building and you're going to drop a box off the side of this building. This box is going to fall downwards. The velocity of the box pointing downwards I'm calling V. How far does the box fall in T seconds? I'm going to call this S of T. Now, we're told that the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared downwards. And because acceleration is the derivative of velocity, that means that velocity is an antiderivative of the acceleration. So the velocity must be an antiderivative of 9.8 or 9.8 plus some constant c meters per second. What is this constant C going to be? Remember that in the question we're told you let go of the box at time zero. When you let go of the box at time zero, the velocity will be zero. From this, we can deduce that the constant must be zero. So the velocity of the box is going to be 9.8 t meters per second. Using this, we can then calculate how far the box falls in, in t seconds, because velocity is the derivative of position. So the, the distance fallen is an antiderivative of velocity. The velocity is 9.8t. An antiderivative of 9.8t is 4.9t squared plus a constant. I've already used C for the previous constant, so I need a new constant, and I'm going to call this C tilde. It's just a new constant, a different constant. I could have done C subscript 2 if I wanted to, or I could have used a different letter like K, but I've chosen to use C tilde. What is this constant C tilde? Again, the question says you let go of the box at time t equal to 0. So in zero seconds, the box has fallen zero meters. So this new constant C tilde must also be zero. Therefore, the distance that the ball, the box falls in t seconds must be 4.9 t squared meters. After five seconds, we can calculate that the box has fallen 122.5 meters. Chapter 31 is about integration. Let's suppose we have a graph. In this example, the graph of y is equal to 1 minus x squared. And we have a region underneath the graph in this case, the region which is bounded by this graph and the x-axis and the y-axis, which I've called R. And my question is, what is the area of R? We can approximate the area of R using two rectangles. I'm trying to fit two rectangles inside this region. I could fit in a box of width, a rectangle of width for half and height three quarters, and then over here I can fit in a box of width for half and height of zero. 
And then we can calculate the, the area of these two red rectangles. We might say that the area of R is approximately equal to the area of these two red rectangles. The left-hand box had width for half and height three quarters, so the area of the left box is three quarters multiplied by half, and the right-hand box had height zero and width for half, so area zero. We're saying that the area of R is approximately equal to 3 over 8 or 0 0.375. Can we do better than this? The answer is yes. We could use more rectangles. Let's suppose instead of using two rectangles, we used four rectangles. Now all of my rectangles have width a quarter. The height of the first rectangle is 15 over 16. How do I know this? Because the function is 1 minus x squared. And if x is a quarter, it's going to be 1 minus a quarter squared. Or 1 minus 1 over 16, which gives me 15 over 16. The second box has height 3 quarters and width 1 quarter. The third box has height 7 over 16 and width quarter, and the final box has height zero. We can calculate this. We can say that the area of R is approximately equal to the area of these four rectangles, and we can calculate this is 0 0.53125. Every time we increase the number of rectangles, the total area of the rectangles gets closer and closer to the area of R. Here, for example, is a picture with 16 rectangles. The area of 16 rectangles is 0 0.63476. We've talked about things getting closer and closer, haven't we? We've talked about what happens when things get closer and closer. We've talked about limits. We're going to use this idea, we're going to take limits of finite sums. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take our interval from 0 to 1 and we're going to cut this into n pieces of width, 1 over n. Here we are, we're going to cut this up like this. The width of each one of these sections, which I'm calling capital delta x, will be equal to 1 over n. And then on each one of these pieces, we're going to draw a rectangle which fits inside the region R. This point, if you can read the writing, is the point with coordinates 1 over n, f of 1 over n. And then we have the point 2 over n, f of 2 over n. Point 3 over n, f of 3 over n, etc. etc. We're going to be using these n rectangles to approximate the area of R. And then we're going to take the limit as n tends to infinity. We go back to the picture. The red rectangle first. The width of the red rectangle is 1 over n, and its height is f of 1 over n. So the first rectangle has area 1 over n multiplied by f of 1 over n. The second rectangle has the same width, also has width 1 over n, and its height is f of 2 over n. And so on the third rectangle, same width 1 over n, but now the height is f of 3 over n. And so on, this repeats. Let's add these all together using this sigma notation from the introduction. The area of all n rectangles is the sum of the areas of the rectangles. What is the area of the kth rectangle? The kth rectangle has width 1 over n and height f of k over n. I'm going to add these up.
Our function is 1 minus x squared, so that's 1 minus k of n squared. Multiply in by 1 over n, we, we have the sum from 1 to n of 1 over n minus k squared over n cubed. For this, a sum rule of sums, we can split this up into two different sums. First the sum of 1 over n, and then minus the sum of k squared over n cubed. First one is easy, it's 1 over n plus 1 over n plus 1 over n plus 1 over n. In fact, we have n lots of 1 over n, so n multiplied by 1 over n. For the second sum, 1 over n cubed, we can take outside of the sum because this is just a constant, we have the sum of k squared. I told you in the introduction what the sum of k squared is. We had the formula that n over n plus 1, 2n plus 1 divided by 6. Simplify this a little bit. We have the formula at the bottom. 1 minus 2n squared plus 3n plus 1 divided by 6n squared. I'll leave this for you to recheck when you have time. If we use n rectangles, then the sum of these n rectangles is given by this formula at the bottom. And then we want to take the limit. We want to take the limit as n tends to infinity. When we take the limit as n tends to infinity of this, First of all, we can divide top and bottom by n squared, cancel n squared with n squared. This becomes 3 divided by n, and this becomes 1 divided by n squared. When n goes to infinity, in other words, when n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, 3 divided by n gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the limit of this term is going to be 0. Likewise, 1 over n squared is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller when n gets bigger and bigger, so the limit of this term will be 0. We're going to end up with 2 on the top and 6 on the bottom. The limit of the sum is going to be 2 thirds. Therefore, the area of the region R is 2 thirds. We can do this more generally. Let's suppose we just have any function f of x. And let's suppose that we use the same idea. We're going to cut our interval into n little pieces, but this time they don't have to be the same size if we don't want to. We can have some small sizes and we're going to have some big sizes. In each one of these sub-intervals, we're going to choose one point, which we're going to call k. In other words, these red dots, we choose one in each one of these intervals. The width of these intervals are not always going to be the same. We need a way to refer to the width of the kth integral. The width of the kth integral we're going to call capital delta x subscript k. And this is going to be xk minus xk minus 1. On each one of these sub-intervals, we're going to draw a rectangle which has width, capital delta xk, and height f of ck. If the function is negative, then the rectangle will go downwards, so we're going to call this a rectangle of negative area. If the function is a positive function, the rectangle will go upwards. The kth rectangle, looking down, bottom right now, is a rectangle of height f of ck and width of delta xk. Add these up, the total of these n rectangles, the total area, if we allow some rectangles to have negative area times to have positive area, will be the sum from 1 to n of f of ck capital delta xk. This is called a Riemann sum for f. 
then we're going to want to take the limit as n tends to infinity. Sometimes this limit exists, sometimes this limit does not exist. Chapter 32, the definite interval. Carries on directly from the previous idea. If this limit exists, if the limit of the Riemann sums exists, then it's called the definite integral of f over the interval from a to b. And we write it like this. Large capital S, subscript a, subscript b, f of x dx is equal to this limit of the Riemann sums if the limit exists. Let's talk about this notation. This large letter S is called the integral sign. The A at the bottom is the lower limit of integration. The B at the top is the upper limit of integration. The function f of x inside the integral is called the integrand. And the dx on the end tells us that x is the variable of integration. We can read this as the integral of f from A to B. And what does it mean? It means the area between the function and the x-axis between a and b. If the function is a positive function, we have we say that the area is positive area. If the function is a negative function, we say that the area is a negative area. If the definite integral exists, in other words, if the limit of the Riemann sums exists, then we say that the function f is integrable on the integral from a to b. For example, we looked at the function 1 minus x squared in the previous chapter. This function is integral on the interval from 0 to 1. And we know that this integral is equal to 2 thirds because we calculated the limit of some sums. I've been using the variable x. I've been writing integral from a to b of f of x dx. But it doesn't matter which letter we use. We could use the letter u instead. Integral from a to b, f of u du. Or I might use the letter t. Integral from a to b, f of t dt. It doesn't matter which letter we use for the variable. So this variable is called the dummy variable. It doesn't matter which letter we use. It's only inside the integral. A theorem. If f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, then f is integral on a to b. In other words, all of the nice functions, all of the nice continuous functions, all of the functions that we can draw without lifting our pen from the paper, are all integral. If f has finitely many jump discontinuities, in other words, if the function looks like this, we have a continuous bit, and then we jump, and we have another continuous bit, a jump, a continuous bit, another continuous bit, and so on. If the function looks like this with finitely many continuous pieces, then the function is also integral on this integral. I want to show you a function which is not integral. Consider the function g defined on the closed interval from 0 to 1, which is defined with the rule that g of x is equal to 1 if x is a rational number, that's a number which can be written as a fraction, and the function which is equal to 0 if x is an irrational number. We might imagine that the function looks like this dot, 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 dot at the top, at one, and also dot, 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 dot at zero. This function is not integral between zero and one. Well, to understand this, let's suppose that we did our 
movement sums. Let's suppose we cut up, cut up our interval. In each interval, we need to choose a point where we measure the rectangle. And let's suppose we always chose rational functions. Then all of our rectangles would have height 1. Our sum of rectangles would be equal to 1, and the limit of 1 is 1. Or we could do this a different way. In each one of these intervals, we could always choose an irrational function to calculate the height of our, of our rectangle. Then we would have rectangles of height 0, and the limit of 0 is 0. But that's two different numbers. The definite integral only exists if the limit of the Riemann sums is always the same number. Because we could have two different limits of Riemann sums here, the function is not integral. Theorem. Let's suppose we have two integrable functions, and let's suppose we have a number k. I want to run through some rules. Let's suppose we wanted to swap the positions of the limits of integration. We could swap these around. It's allowed to swap A and B around as long as we put a minus sign in front. If we have a function, if we multiply it by a number, we can take the number k outside of the integral. This is the constant multiple rule. Instead of integrating from a to b, we might do two smaller integrals. We might integral, integrate from a to c first, and then integrate from c to b. And I'm saying the blue area plus the red area is the same as all of this green area. If the, two, the limits are the same, the integral from a to a, we would have something which looks like this. We would have an area of width zero. In other words, we'd have an we'd have that the definite integral is equal to zero because the area of this line is equal to zero. The sum rule. Let's suppose we have f plus g. We can split this up into two small integrals. Instead of doing the integral of f plus g, we could do the integral of f plus the integral of g. Next, suppose we have, suppose we want to calculate some inequalities for an integral. I'm saying that this blue area, the area underneath the graph, that's the integral from a to b f of x dx, is smaller than this orange rectangle. This orange rectangle has width b minus a, and it has height maximum of f. I'm also saying that this blue area, that's all of this, is bigger than the green rectangle. The green rectangle has width b minus a and height minimum of f. And this we can see from the picture. Let's suppose we know that, at least on this interval, g is always bigger than f. I don't care what happens over on the left. I don't care what happens only over on the right. I only care what happens between a and b. And let's suppose between a and b, g is always bigger than f. But then the integral of g must be bigger than the integral of f. That makes sense. Likewise, if g is always positive, then the integral of g must be positive. What about an even function? 
Here's a picture of an even function at the bottom. An even function is a function where we can imagine putting a mirror on the x, on the y-axis, and the left-hand side is a mirror image of the right-hand side. The integral from minus a to a, that's all of this area, I'm saying is equal to two times the red area. That's straightforward. We can see that from the picture. For an odd function, an odd function is a function where we could take our graph and we could rotate the graph 180 degrees, and it would look the same. The integral from minus a to a is 0, because every time we have a positive bit, we have a negative bit of the same size. And positive plus negative is going to be equal to 0. Let's do some examples. Let's suppose we have two functions, f, f and h. We don't know the fun what functions they are, but we're told that the integral of f between minus 1 and 1 is 5. The integral of f between 1 and 4 is minus 2. And the integral of h between minus 1 and 1 is 7. That's all the information that we have. We're asked to calculate the integral from 4 to 1 of f of x dx. Remember, we can swap the positions of 4 and 1 as long as we put a minus sign on the front. So we get our answer 2. The integral from minus 1 to 1 of 2f plus 3h. The integral of f is 5 and the integral of h is 7. So we're going to have 2 times 5 plus 3 times 7, or 31. The integral from minus 1 to 4. We can break this into two different integrals. First, we can do the integral from minus 1 to 1, which we know. And then we can do the integral from 1 to 4, which we also know. So 5 plus minus 2. Next example, show that the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 plus cos x is less than or equal to the square root of 2. Again, we can use the previous theorem because we know the maximum value of what the square root plus 1 plus cos x. Cos goes between minus 1 and 1. So how, what is the biggest possible value of this? The biggest possible value is the square root of 1 plus 1, or square root of 2. So this integral must be less than or equal to the width of the integral, that's 1 minus 0, multiplied by the maximum possible value of this function, or 1 multiplied by u2. Calculate the integral from minus 2 to 2 of x cubed plus x dx. We know how to do this. We have an odd function. And remember, the integral of an odd function, if it's minus 2 or 2, the integral of an odd function must always be 0. We don't need to calculate much. We just remember the rule, and we write down that the answer is equal to 0. Calculate the integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1 minus x squared dx. Again, it's minus a number and plus a number for the limits of integration. And now we have an even function. What is the rule for an even function? The rule for an even function is that our integral is equal to 2 multiplied by half the area, or in this case, the integral from 0 to 1. We know the integral from 0 to 1 is 2 thirds, so it's 2 multiplied by 2 thirds. Calculate the integral from 0 to b of x dx. 
for some number b which is greater than zero. I'm going to solve this problem two ways. For the first solution, I'm going to use a Riemann sum. First thing to do is to take our interval from zero to b and cut this into n pieces. And just to make this easier, I'm going to cut this into pieces which are all of the same width. I'm going to cut this into n pieces where the width of each piece is b divided by n. In each one of these intervals, we need to choose a point. I'm going to choose a nice easy one. I'm going to choose, always choose the point KB over N. Here's a picture of what we're doing. We're going to be approximating the area we want with these rectangles. This time, because I'm choosing the right hand side of each interval to calculate the height of the rectangle, each one of these rectangles is going to be slightly bigger than. It's going to be sticking up above the region, but that's okay. We're going to be closer and closer to the region when we take the limit as n tends to infinity. Our Riemann sum is the sum from 1 to n of f at ck, that's the height of the rectangle, multiplied by delta xk, that's the width of the rectangle. The height of each rectangle is going to be kb over n, and the width of each rectangle is always going to be the same. It's always going to be b over n. So we're calculating the sum of kbb over nn. b and n are constants. We can take those outside of the sum. Get b squared over n squared outside. And then we're just doing the sum from 1 to n of k. We know the sum. We have a formula for this. This is n, n plus 1 over 2. Divide by n squared, we get b squared over 2 multiplied by 1 plus 1 over n. This is our formula for the area of these n rectangles. We're going to take the limit of this formula. We're taking the limit as n tends to infinity of b squared over 2, 1 plus 1 over n. When n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, b squared over 2 stays the same, 1 stays the same, 1, n over, 1 over n gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. The limit of 1 over n as n tends to infinity is 0. So we just end up with b squared over, n, over 2. This is actually an easier way to answer this question. We could just use triangles because the integral from 0 to b of x dx is just this a the area of this triangle. And we know the area of the triangle, of course, is just half multiplied by height multiplied by base. So instead of all that work with Riemann sums, we could have just said a half multiplied by b multiplied by b is b squared over 2. Now that we know the integral from 0 to b, we can also calculate the integral from a to b of x and dx. I can split this up into two integrals, integral from a to 0 and then integral from 0 to b. I want to swap the positions of a and 0. We can do this as long as we put a minus sign in the front. So we have minus the integral from 0 to a plus the integral from 0 to b. And we know these. The integral from 0 to a must be a squared over 2. The integral from 0 to b must be b squared over 2. So we get our answer. We've rearranged this slightly. b squared over 2 minus a squared over 2. And that is the end of this week's lesson. Next week, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is the most important theorem in calculus. We'll talk about a technique we can use to find 
some more advanced integrals called the substitution method. And then we'll end with an application calculating the area between curves. Are there any questions? The final exam will examine the whole course. Um, it will be a test where you have to write your answers on paper, showing your working. You'll have to take a photograph of your paper and, and then upload the image. <laughs> 